How can you communicate better with your patients? Are you reading the room and making sure you're tailoring the discussion to the patient in front of you? Find out how to communicate better on this episode. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a show by me, Dr. Bradley Block, and this is a practical guide for practicing physicians where we interview experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Dr. John Schneider, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Brad. It's great. Dr. Block. <laughs> Only my parents call me Dr. Block. <laughs> right. So you're, you're an academic rhinologist. You're an associate professor at Wash U. And, and, and you're exploring things that, at least from my experience, haven't been traditionally explored in academic practice, right? You are, you mentioned during the, the pre-recording, you are training to be a physician coach. And something yeah. that we're going to be talking more about today is something you're focusing on is is optimizing your communications and teaching your residents and colleagues how to optimize their communication with their patients. Right. So let's start before we get into the coaching. Let's talk about the communication. So how did you get started in trying to optimize your own communications? Sure. So, so there's a little bit of a story behind this, which is I was going to get my PhD in economics, actually, initially coming out of college. And I ended up doing a master's degree in public policy. And what I was most interested in was decision-making. So decision-making theory, albeit from an economic perspective. But when I was uh, a couple of years into practice, I was asked to give a leadership lecture and wasn't the leader of much of anything at the time, but a colleague who was uh, interested in what I do, um, gave me uh, the opportunity to do this. And so when I was doing that, I was thinking a lot about the decision-making aspect. And what I was really thinking about at the time was it's really hard in medicine sometimes to translate what we're thinking and how we're making decisions. And that can be very, very, very challenging for all of us. And we make very complex decisions, right? Whether that's how to take out a skull-based tumor or how to treat chronic sinusitis or whether or not to do a heart transplant. I mean, any number of things that we do from the most mundane to the most complex. And I started just observing people and observing myself. And in particular, in my own practice, I became very hyper-aware and self-aware of whether or not I was really reaching my patients with the way I was communicating. And I thought that there might be a way to understand this better. And that brought me into this idea of studying communication and decision-making in medicine together. And so what linked that for me was, how do I think as a physician and how do I then translate that to a patient in such a way that I don't play to my own cognitive biases, but I really listen to whether the patient is understanding what I'm saying. And that's kind of how this started. So I started looking into the ways in which we think as physicians and whether there are certain uh, pitfalls in our thinking that may translate to maybe less effective communication. That's actually one of the reasons why I started the podcast is, is I saw that some of my partners were able to see many more patients per hour than me, and I didn't understand why. So mm. I wanted to become a better communicator. And, and part of it, I think, that slows us down is we tend to say things for us and not necessarily for the patients. Like, I've right. got to get this off my chest. There are certain things during this visit that need to be said, not really paying attention to whether the fact the patient's even zoned out or their understanding or they even want to understand, right? Like, and so, right. you know, what you're talking about can translate into one more fulfilling visit for the patient, better understanding of what's going on with their own healthcare, and two, a more efficient practice and fulfilling practice. So you're not just, you know, we have all got these these spiels in our head that we say right. over and over in the same way every time. You can even get lost thinking about something else while we're saying it because we've said it so many times. So I think yeah. you know, to your point, making sure that the patient's understanding that we're we're on the same page as them, on the same level as them, explaining it in the way that's best for them, not necessarily for us. What's so interesting about it is that the more complex the decision making that we are doing, 
the more we end up speaking for ourselves, right? Because in the act of speaking, we're often working out some pretty complex decision making, right? So, for example, you have a complex sinus case. Obviously, I'm choosing this because it's in my area, but you have a complex sinus case and you're not sure whether your frontal sinus surgery is going to be as simple as a, as a draft one, or are you going to need to do a draft three? In your real time, you're looking. Just for the, the this is a oh, not yeah. otolaryngologist yes, audience, just <laughs> FYI. Right. So, so what he's yes. talking about is like drilling down a wall above the septum between the frontal sinus. Is he going to need to open all of that up and, you know, the complexity of right. that? But Sorry we don't need to dive that. into the yeah, specifics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no yeah. Or to, to make it better for the audience, you know, whether or not, you know, how extensive a surgery to do, essentially, right? And and the problem is that in real time in front of the patient, you're doing a lot of very active thinking at the time. You're sitting there, you're talking to the patient, you're going over the CT scan, and that can be enormously cognitively taxing. It takes a lot of our attention away from the patient, potentially, and just we're focused entirely on the data. And once you kind of realize that process, you start to see it in yourself and you start to see it in others. And you start to see that the talking becomes much more about your own thinking than it does actually communicating with the patient. And that can translate to even interprofessional interactions, whether it's with your staff, with other physicians, with administrators, whatever it is, if you're caught processing your own cognition and being hyper focused on that what you're saying may be absolutely secondary and not translatable to that other person so that's where that's where this kind of started and I'll give you an example i work with neurosurgeons a lot and we take we do a lot of surgery where we go through the nose to take pituitary tumors out and after many years of working with these neurosurgeons and sitting with them and um watching them communicate with families because we would often go together i saw the speeches they would give you alluded to it the other way we have we have these spiels that we have these kind of canned speeches that we have around as physicians around the things that we treat and that's in a sense you can look at it as our own way of preserving our cognitive effort because if we say the same thing over and over again, we don't necessarily have to invest a lot of extra cognitive energy to tailor it to the patient. But that means that we may not actually be tailoring it to the patient in the right way. It's interesting that Dr. Schneider is referring to tailoring. Right? Is yeah, that right. Schneider means exactly. in German? You got Taylor. it. You got it. <laughs> right. Hedonic adaptation is the idea that you can get used to anything, anything over time, and it can stop bringing you joy, including even especially your job. It just stops being as stimulating as it once was. So you can add some excitement and some supplemental income by finding part or even full-time work at Locum Tenants. Locumstory.com has tools that let us see trends for our specialty and even comparing different Locum's agencies. The Locum Story blog also features perspectives from actual Locum physicians like us. They have firsthand experience and write about it. Locumstory.com is the perfect place to start if you want to learn more about Locum tenants. So visit Locumstory.com today at L-O-C-U-M story, all one word, dot com. So I think what happens over time with these these speeches, these mm -hmm. spiels, right, is that we hone them. I The way I see it is like, it's almost like a comedian and their shtick, right? If they tell a joke that bombs, then they're going to change it the next time and they're going to change it, they're going to change mm -hmm. it, they change it. And so it evolves, their, their routine evolves over time. I think our routines evolve over time as we find, you know, little nuances to add or take away from the speech because something happens to hit. I, right. uh, you know, something raises a, a red flag. You don't say that anymore. Or the light bulb goes off in the patient's eyes and, and you start using that again, or you get a laugh, right? A chuckle. You're mm -hmm. going to keep using that again. So I, 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 I agree that it, it does ease the cognitive load, but at the same time, it's, it is a variable 
that it is fluid. It can be, right? And in fact, this is always a double-edged sword, right? The more time that we can tailor our communication in such a way that we don't have to spend extra cognitive energy on it, the more cognitive energy we have to spend on other things. So one, one concept in this is this idea that we have limited cognitive energy. And um, there's a great book, and now I'm completely remember, uh, not remembering the title, but the author refers to our, our, my, uh, us as being cognitive misers. We very much want to preserve our cognitive effort. And it's, in a sense, a survival tool, right? We don't want to expend all of our cognitive effort in the first hour of the day and not be able to function the rest of the day. So in large part, you could argue that you're right, that the the way we come up with these speeches in medicine or these spiels are ways for us to find what works, to find the way that it works for us, you know, because it actually is us translating the information, right? You're right. We may find that patients understand the narrative of a surgery better if we explain it a certain way, and we'll use that way more often. And that's true. I absolutely do that. If I recorded myself, a lot of the things that I say in patient visits would sound very similar from patient to patient. That's the good part. The flip side of it, which is maybe the pitfall, is that if we're not listening to whether or not the patient is actually hearing our speech and it's making sense to them, we run the risk of keeping our canned speech going and it not really being a way that we translate information to that particular patient. So we have to build in ways to be aware enough in those communication interactions to determine if the patient really understands what we're talking about. Does that make sense? So I think, yeah, I think what you're saying is because we're being cognitive misers, right? We're saving some of that cognitive load by going through this spiel. As long as we are aware of that, we can use that remaining cognitive energy mm -hmm. to read the room, right? Right? Because you've so, said this so many times, you don't have to concentrate as hard as, do, as doing that. And you can concentrate more on reading the room, reading the right. patients, reading their nonverbal cues to make sure that they're following along and then changing things accordingly. Right. But I think the first thing, as you said, is awareness. Is right is you have to be aware that you're doing it, aware that it's happening, and then you can capitalize on that situation. Yeah. Have you have you read Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman? No, no. All right. So this is a foundational book in behavioral economics. And I actually think it should be required reading for all physicians. But Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky were two Israeli psychologists who came up with something called prospect theory, which eventually earned Danny Kahneman the Nobel Prize in Economics. Unfortunately, Amos Tversky uh, had died before that award occurred. But, but what they came up with, which is percolated throughout psychological literature, economics literature, and even made its way into medicine, is this idea that we have two systems of thinking. One is the slow, effortful, cognitively taxing thinking. So solving, you know, 329 times 512, right? We can't do that quickly. And then we have very fast, intuitive thinking that's based on a lot of heuristics. So most of us, if we ask what two times four is, it's immediate, right? Now you ask a child who's learning math for the first time, they don't know what two times four is. But over time, we develop cognitive shortcuts to help us think faster. Okay, and it's akin to this idea of the cognitive miser, right? We want to do certain cognitive tasks quickly with little effort so we can reserve our cognitive energy for the things that are going to, going to require more effort. And that foundational work around what they call heuristics and biases, which are the ways in which we shortcut our thinking to make it more efficient, is really the foundation of a lot of this, uh, a lot of these ideas. And if you think about it and sit with it for a minute, that's a lot of what physicians do in many different aspects of our career. That's true of a lot of professionals. We train in order to move from slow thinking to fast thinking, to become more efficient in our thinking so that we can be more efficient in what we do. And as somebody who trained in, in, in otolaryngology, in ENT, right, you know that that's 
essentially what happens to us as trainees and as young attendings. We train and get faster and get more efficient and get and are able to think through problems in a much more efficient manner as we gain more experience and knowledge through our training. And oftentimes that's really the transition from slow thinking to fast thinking. And what I argue is that the same thing happens in our communication, just as you said. As we practice our speeches and as we find out what works and what doesn't work, we get to a point where we're very good at communicating about sinusitis. We're very good at communicating about heart disease. Acoustic neuromas. At least we think we are. We think well, we, we think are. we are. Right? Yeah, right. Not necessarily that we are. But if we lose that awareness and we don't listen, then we run the risk of communicating again for ourselves and not necessarily for our patients. Someone that I've had in the show before, Jonathan Howard, he's a, he's a neurologist at, at NYU, mm -hmm. wrote mm -hmm. a whole book on cognitive biases in medicine. Mm -hmm. And I've had him on the show twice. And each time was the with the intention of talking about that book. And he always convinces me to interview him about something else, but I definitely want to get back into it to talk about, yeah. have him talk about all the cognitive biases that we have in medicine. For instance, like if you make a diagnosis, if that's something that you don't typically see very often, then you're more likely to make that diagnosis soon after again, because it's just fresh in your mind, even if mm -hmm. that's not the correct diagnosis, right? So, right. so these cognitive biases, these shortcuts and these heuristics, they, they can be to our benefit, but they can also be to, to our detriment. Right. Absolutely. Like, uh, for me in private practice, you know, before the patient gets to you as, as the academic rhinologist, I'm seeing, you know, nine times out of 10, same as the literature says, I'm seeing migraines that are presenting with facial pressure. And the patient's been on a billion different antibiotics and, and mm -hmm. diagnosed with sinusitis and has, and has never had a sinus infection. So I see this pattern over and over. And then sometimes what ends up happening is confirmation bias. Like I'm mm -hmm. just hearing the things that align with the diagnosis that I think is going to be the correct diagnosis. And, and you end up maybe minimizing the the symptoms. Um, I mean, if a plaintiff's attorney is listening to this, I don't do that. I'm just saying there's probably there are probably doctors out there that, that do. So confirmation biases, I think, is a problem with our listening. Is that something that you've encountered? Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the fundamental tenets of uh, what 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 I've kind of put together on this is that there are a number of biases actually that can really impede listening. And confirmation bias is a, is a huge one. It's not typically thought of in medicine necessarily because we're really supposed to and, and often and most of the time really do evaluate the data appropriately and, and, and you know, equally weigh all the pieces of data in such a way that we can come to the right diagnosis. What's tough, and I think this is where a number of specialties across medicine encounter this more than maybe others do. Sorry, actually, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I want to I want to mm -hmm. push back on that because when I'm seeing patients from other physicians, I mm -hmm. tend to see trends. Some doctors, like in our specialty, right? Some mm -hmm. doctors see reflux everywhere they look. Some people, yeah. some doctors see sinusitis everywhere they look. I happen to see mm -hmm. migraines and asthma everywhere I look mm -hmm. and TMJ. Mm -hmm. Those things come up in my practice all the time. Is it because those patients gravitate towards me or because I'm more acutely aware of it and maybe less acutely aware of reflux than one of my partners or, or are we not as perceptive as we think? And so we, we're looking out for the things that we think we're seeing. I think it depends. And, and what I was going to say, and this, this is an answer to your question is, when you have data in front of you that is unambiguous, okay, and I'm going to pick on the orthopedic specialists here. When somebody walks into your clinic and they're walking towards you, but their foot is pointed backwards, right? There's no ambiguity about what's going on, right? Anatomically, that patient's foot is not in the right position, right? And so when you talk to that patient, after you get hopefully past the pain and screaming that they may be encountering, you and the patient and every other, if you brought in eight other doctors, they would all have the same opinion about what's going on, right? There would not be a lot of diagnostic uncertainty around that condition, okay? Same is true, for example, if somebody's eye is bulging out of their head, right? There's no ambiguity to that. Now, there may be a lot of ambiguity as to the cause, okay? 
and that may come down the road with it, you know, imaging, but you don't have to sit there and have a challenge of interpret interpreting what's going on. But there are a lot of conditions out there that you and I encounter, especially in ENT, but our rheumatology colleagues, our neurology colleagues, where the patient comes in complaining of a sensation, pain, globus sensation, which is a feeling of something caught in the throat. Fa you know, uh, we said facial pain, uh, facial pressure, tinnitus, right? Where we can't necessarily find a physical exam finding. And when there's less data and there's more ambiguity or more uncertainty around the actual diagnosis, what are we going to play to as physicians? We want to come up with an explanation. The patient wants us to come up with an explanation, right? But without a lot of data, we, cr we have to create a narrative that makes sense. So how do we do that? Well, we do that based on experience. We do that based on literature. We do that based on what we've been taught, but we also do it based on experience. So you're right. If you have a clinic where you're diagnosing every other patient who has facial pain with migraine, are you more likely to think migraine is a cause of facial pain? Probably. Are you more likely to consider migraine as one of the diagnoses? Probably. But the pitfall, as you say, is are you considering all of the possible diagnoses? And what I've learned over the years, and I, this is something I've had to learn, which I think, is, I think we all do as, as physicians, is to recognize when we're jumping to that diagnostic conclusion in the absence of data. And we should always ask ourselves, is there more data that might challenge that? Is there more data or more testing that we can do to get to the bottom of that? Sometimes there isn't, but we, if we jump to that conclusion and we engage our confirmation bias, right? A classic one that you may have, in, I'm sure you encounter all the time is, the patient says, oh, I have this terrible, terrible sinus infection. Every time it happens, I have to go into a dark room and sleep with no noise because it's, my head hurts too much. And, and the Z-pack always makes it feel better. <laughs> right. And classically, right, that sounds like migraine. And so would be cognitively easier to say, given the probability that that's likely migraine, would I do anything else for this patient? Or, you know, just send them to, you know, send them to a neurologist for, for appropriate migraine, you know, evaluation and treatment. Well, that's always the risk, in a sense, is whether or not you've really kind of said, well, could it be something else? And have I done the workup that is necessary to really prove that it's not something else? But then we're talking about like we're, we're getting into economics, right? So it's all connected. Every patient that has those classic right. symptoms need a CAT scan to confirm it. Like right. the likelihood that they're going to go to see a neurologist, the neurologist is going to get an MRI. Do they really need a CAT scan as well? Like, right. you know, we're radiating the patient. There are incidental omas. Like they, and, and this gets mm -hmm. back to what you were saying about all of that decision making that we do that is complicated, right? This thing, right. there's the patient has a deductible. There's going to be an expense for the CAT scan. Is it really mm -hmm. necessary to for them to have to pay that? They might find something on the CAT scan that's an incidentaloma that now we're going to have to work up for X, right. Y, and Z and only to find out that they were fine. And so, yeah. So And imagine doing that 30 to 40 times a day. Yeah. Right? It's, I think it would be impossible. I mean, one of the reasons that we have put, we, medicine has, ha has developed guidelines around this, including the Choosing Wisely campaign, is to give some physicians some guidance around when it's appropriate to do these tests. The challenge is, you know, not jumping so far to the conclusion and the diagnosis based on incomplete information and listening well enough to the patient and listening to when your biases might be pushing you to be a cognitive miser and in a sense being able to self check or check yourself and kind of disengage those biases so that you can say, okay, this might be the time when I get a CAT scan, right? That there might be that one thing that says, gosh, you know, yes, this all sounds like migraine, but maybe there's a, a hint of something else going on and it's worth getting that CAT scan. And, and I would also think that engaging the patient there as well about the uncertainty of diagnoses is right. important, right? 
So something that we've talked about on previous podcasts is, is with nonverbal communication with the patient, there, there's, you have to exude interest and authority. So interest you exude with your facial expressions and then authority with your verbal communication. So you already want to keep that authority because otherwise the patient's going to lose confidence in you. So, so you do want to keep that authority, but at the same time, inform them that. Nobody bats a thousand. It's possible that this isn't the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Maintain your communication with me. And then if there's anything that, that, you know, that makes us second guess the diagnosis, let me know. So that one is going to help the patient, I think, have more faith in you because you're recognizing your fallibility and also medical legally mm -hmm. leaves it a little more open ended in case you are incorrect and there's, and there's an untoward outcome that you've, you've left the door open for the patient to say, you know what? The management strategy didn't work. The neurologist doesn't think it's migraines. And then, you know, and then it's back in your court. And then you can have the opportunity to work them up a little more. Absolutely. And again, we're kind of swinging back to the communication piece, which is to say that you are communicating a lot more than just information, right? And I think this is where medicine has not done a great job of teaching physicians, although it's changing, what communication really is. We're communicating information all the time, and we're exchanging information all the time. But what you were talking about was what I call communicating meaning, that what we're really saying is this is why the information is meaningful to me. This is why I'm interpreting it this way, essentially sharing our thinking with the patient so that they can understand why we've chosen to go down a certain pathway of diagnosis or treatment. But then establishing that relationship with the patient such that we can think together. And, you know, this is the fundamental tenets of shared decision making, which has been, um, what you think about it is actually a revolution in medicine. If you go back, and I think for a lot of us who are still relatively young in the field of medicine, we don't recognize this because it's relatively ingrained in the way we're taught now. But shared decision-making was not medicine prior to maybe the late 90s, early 2000s. Medicine was still a very paternalistic model of communication, right? Oh, you mentioned Globus. The, the full mm -hmm. name was Globus yep, Hystericus. You, get, you got it. Absolutely. You, you feel like you've got something stuck in your throat, do you? Well, mm -hmm. I don't see anything, and therefore you are being hysterical. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I just used that. My, we just yeah. used that in my class the other week when we were talking about communication, right? Is that even the names of what we talk about confer a lot of meaning to our patients. And so, you know, these are all, these are all issues that are interconnected, right? But the cognition to me is the piece that links it all, right? Because the systems that we create in healthcare are all founded on how we think whether that's the economics of it, whether that's the communication piece, whether that's the, you know, the different policy aspects, whatever it may be. And when we communicate to our patients, we are communicating about so many things, whether it's their insurance, whether it's what's going to be covered, whether it's their recovery, whether it's their, you know, side effects of the treatment, whether it's, um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. And the biggest challenge I think that we face in, in growth as physicians is being able to communicate all of that complex information in such a way that we are accurate in the information, that we are rigorous in ensuring that we're interpreting the information correctly, but also that we're really conveying meaning to the patient so that they understand it the way we do. And that last piece is sometimes the hardest, right? You and I got taught, I'm sure, very early on about not using medical jargon too much, right? That's a kind of fundamental tenet in training physicians to communicate. And in large part, that comes from the fact that it's really trying not to overwhelm patients with words that are meaningless, to them, that are uninterpretable because it's just a different language. And so that's one piece of it. But there's lots of other pieces where we can really impress upon patients the meaning of what we're doing. And that is very, very, very good because it establishes a much stronger relationship between the patient and the physician, which has lots of benefits for the patient. We're going to be winding down in a second. So 
as an academic attending, yeah. right? You're working, you're working with residents, you're working mm -hmm. with medical students, or, or you could answer this with something you would tell your colleagues, right? So as you're working with someone, if you witness a common communication, maybe a mistake or, or something mm -hmm. they could approve upon, what are, mm -hmm. what's a common tip? Mm that you give yeah. to either your trainees, or your colleagues. And I would imagine, given that you're speaking on this, you sometimes get approached by people as well for this. Yeah. So, you know, one of the most common things that I tell people is, and I use the biases that are out there in the literature to do this, and this is just one of many, but one of the biggest biases that's been described is something called the IKEA effect. And real quickly, this was based on a experiment, and uh, there's a good book on this by Dan Ariely from Duke uh, called Predictably, Predictably Irrational, I think is the title. But this idea that they gave students these bionicle, they're like Legos, basically, for those who don't know, that you build into a robot. And they gave one group the kit to build and then price to sell, so they were going to sell it, right? And they gave another group already built bionicles, and they asked them to go sell these. And the group that built the Bionicle consistently priced their product higher, even though it was the same product, and in negotiations would be w less willing to accept a lower bid on, those, on the same product. So they, they valued the robot that they built much higher than the people who didn't build the robot, even though it was the same robot. That is a very common thing that we do in medicine. When we have an idea and we've made a conclusion and we've worked it out and we've spent the cognitive energy around coming to that conclusion, it's very hard for us to admit it's the wrong one. And while even sometimes in the presence of new data, and so we have to be careful about the IKEA effect. We have to be careful about how much we value our own ideas, especially when the conclusion isn't as clear as we would like it to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Was it strong convictions loosely held? <laughs> That's right. That's a good one. I like you can, you're much better at summarizing this than I am. <laughs> I like that. 200 and maybe 50 episodes in. I think I appreciate that. <laughs> right, right, right. That's good. So if people want to find you, right, because we didn't, unfortunately, we don't have time to get into the to the physician coaching aspect, but that's something yeah. that you're training, training to do right now, or, mm -hmm. you know, they, they want to get in touch with you, find you online. Wh where can people find you? Well, so uh, the fastest way is that obviously uh, the Washington University School of Medicine Otolaryngology website. I'm still building my coaching website, so I that'll be uh, uh, forthcoming, but I do have a private email. That's probably the best way right now, and it's pretty pretty easy. It's bearstone75 at gmail.com. And what is this story behind Bear Stone? <laughs> well, Stone is actually my middle name, which everybody is always uh, interested to learn. And I don't know. My kids tell me that I look like a bear, so it just seemed to go together. I guess it's the beard. Well, for those who are listening to the podcast, check out the YouTube video and you will uh, you will see why a fellow, yes. uh, fellow bearded man. <laughs> yes, there you go. Well, Dr. John Schneider, I, I learned a lot from speaking to you. Thanks for the great work that you're doing with, with your trainees and helping us all to be better communicators. And thank you for your time. Well, Brad, I really appreciate you having me on. And I want to tell you one thing that what really attracted me to your podcast was the title, because I actually think that one of the things that we could all use is I like to think of it as behavioral doctoring, but I like how you've cut the physician's guide to doctoring. It's a great, great, great concept. So kudos to you as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, that was just me trying to optimize for search engines. If you look for physician or doctor, it would, it would come up. <laughs> right. Awesome. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, man. Thanks for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast player. I'm also available for medical legal consulting and keynote speaking if you're interested, or to just give us some feedback on the show, email me at brad at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com. I'll see you next week.
The ideas expressed in this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. Those in this podcast accept no liability for medical decisions based on the information herein. And as the radiologists like to say, clinical correlation is required. This is not medical advice. This does not constitute a physician-patient relationship. And if you have a medical problem, seek medical attention.